Inventory management. First point is it is important because it involves a lot of capital investment such as storage costs, insurance costs, pilferage costs, and costs that the inventory may be out to date. The second point is the size of the investment in inventory depend on the type of the business of the company is it. For example, services di mana kita ada dua, Maxis yang jual telefon dengan Maxis yang jual telco. Okay, uh, Maxis yang jual uh, telefon ni, capital dia lagi besar sebab dia simpan inventory berbanding Maxis yang jual telco. So next, we will proceed to the next slide which is purpose of carrying inventory. The point is to uncouple the operations of the firm that is to make each function of the business independent of each other function so that the delay or shutdown in one area do not affect production and sale of the final product. Uh, kita bagi contoh mixing dengan cooking department. Okay. Tahu kita kan, kalau mixing ada problem, dia akan effect the next uh, area lah which is cooking department. Okay, so company will avoid this thing from happen. Uh, dengan cara the company uh, akan suruh the mixing department buat siap-siap uh, dia punya pro, uh, mixing tu supaya kalau nanti mixing tu ada problem, Cooking can proceed untuk buat uh, untuk buat the next level the next level lah. So dia tak akan effect uh, satu di, uh, akan effect next department tu. Even satu department tu tak boleh dijalankan. So dia still boleh produce dia punya product. So there are three types of inventories that we have to know. The first one is raw materials, which consists of basic materials purchased from other firms to be used in the firm's production operations. Its purpose is to uncouple the production function from the purchasing function to make these two functions independent of each other so that delays of sh in shipment of raw materials do not cause production delays, which means that a firm will try to avoid any uh, production stoppage when there is a delay in shipment of raw materials. So the next one is work in progress, which consists of partially finished goods requiring additional work before before they become finished goods. The more complex and lengthy the production process, the larger the investment in work in progress inventory. Its purpose is to uncouple the various operations in the production process so that the machine failures and work stoppage in one operation will not affect the other operations, which means that if there is a problem occur during the previous operation, uh, process, the next process will not be affected and will continue to operate as usual. The last one is finished goods, which consists of goods on which the production has completed but that are not yet sold. The purpose is to uncouple the production and sales function so that it is not necessary to produce the goods before a sale can occur. Sales can be made directly out of inventory, which means that um, the firm will have to constantly produce the finished goods, not just when there is a sale. So EOQ is economic order quantity. When we are starting our business, we need to buy inventory and we need to know how much inventory that is needed. So we should not buy too much or in of inventory or too little of inventory. If our inventory is too much, we will experience spoilage and also that will increase the storage cost. Next, if the inventory is too little, we might experience stock up, which means when a customer comes, there is no inventory item that left. So, um, EOQ is used to determine the optimal or the size of inventory after taking into account its expected usage, its handling cost and its ordering cost so that the cost of inventory will be minimized. It is used by inventory management by calculating the number of units that need to add to its inventory after uh, with each batch of order in order to reduce the inventory cost. It is used to ensure that the company do not order too frequently or there is no excess of inventory. So, the total inventory cost is equal to total ordering cost plus with the total handling cost. 
total ordering cost uh, is a cost that is incurred every time inventory every time an order for inventory is made to supplier so ordering cost include administrative cost of placing and receiving order which comprise of cost of writing purchase order processing it and checking it with the invoice next is handling cost handling cost is include with the storage cost and also insurance cost cost of deterioration and obsolescence and also the opportunity cost of funds invested in the inventory items assalamualaikum and greetings to all today i would like to talk about my part for the topic which is about abc uh, system or method so abc system or method is one of the common techniques used to manage our inventory so the inventory is classified is categorized and divided into three groups which is a b and c firstly we'll go to a a is the category in which the item has the highest value of investment means that the company puts in a lot of money for this particular item which is uh, item a they are seen as a priority item and much effort is given to make sure that the stock doesn't run out so it is also verified using perpetual inventory system and is closely monitored whether it is daily or weekly depends on the business or firm next we have b so b has the second highest value of investment and is also monitored closely uh, it is close it is monitored on a weekly basis and then the last one is c c has is basically has the la uh, large number of item in relative to a small amount of investment means that it is the most cheapest and lowest consumption made by the company so it is monitored using to be method what is to be method to be method is basically to determine when the material or item should be replenished so just like its name we have two bins bin one and bin two so when bin one the materials in bin one is completely used up a second a second order will be made to uh, to fill in the bin one so in the meantime we will use bin two the second bin is used to have enough uh, used to have enough uh, material or item until the second order will be used to fill in the first bin the previous order that we made is used to fill in the first bin so one example that i can give you which was already discussed in class is about the shoe production um, we have Gucci we have Nike and also the Japanese foot sandals so it is obvious that Gucci will be in group will be categorized as item A because it is an expensive product whereas B the Nike shoe is considered as an affordable shoes that can be uh, bought by many people or my majority but it is in between a and c therefore it will be classified as b whereas the last one the japanese foot sandals is the most cheapest among three shoes therefore it is uh, to be classified as c um, with that thank you okay so today i'll be explaining about just in time inventory system or in the short term is known as jit inventory system so just-in-time inventory system is a system that ensure inputs in production only arrive when they are needed. GIT inventory system is a system or a set of techniques that improve quality, increase productivity and reduce cost of operation. So the biggest advantage of implementing GIT inventory system is that it can help to minimize cost so the biggest saving occurs around around inventory costs. 
So I'll be giving an example of a company that implement just-in-time inventory system, which is Toyota. So Toyota will keep making the same order as soon as the order arrive. So by doing so, Toyota won't need to keep uh, stockpiles of their spare parts. This will cause a huge amount of savings since warehousing is very expensive and it requires a lot of cost. For example, it requires a cost of inspecting, cost of waiting, staff, security, massive space and electricity. So if the company do not implement this GIT inventory system, they will need to build a warehouse to keep their raw materials or supplies. So next, Toyota also will be able to customize product according to their customer's demand. So if there is no custom, if there is no demand from the customer, the production will not be going on. This will help to reduce waste in the firm. Next, the image can be spotted immediately as the inventory is built according to customer's demand only. So this will result in management efficiency. I will explain about MRP system. MRP stands for Material Requirement Planning System. It is a computer-based inventory system that will determine three things. The first one is what type of materials to, per to order, when to order, and how much to order. So how is this MRP uh, simulation is carried out is by identifying two things, uh, which are uh, production schedule and bill of material. For production schedule, it consists of um, manufacturing process and inventory status. So at this part, we will know when uh, to produce these finished goods. And for the second part is bill of materials. Uh, it's a, it is a list of raw materials needed and how much to purchase in order to produce these uh, finished goods. So it's basically a list of whatever materials needed to produce the finished goods. So this MRP system will help the management uh, to keep track on all the materials needed uh, to produce the finished goods so that um, it can be produced within the time given. For example, the company um, produced shoes. So by July, the company needs to produce 200 pairs of shoes. Um, so we don't know uh, what type to order, when to order and how much. So by having this MRP system, it will help the management to know uh, that we need to order uh, the raw materials such as uh, the first one is we need to order fabric and the second one is uh, rubber. These are the examples of main materials need to produce these finished goods. So um, by having this um, system, we will know that we need to order uh, 1,000 kilogram of rubbers and 1,000 meters of fabrics. So, um, uh, and when to order is we need to order three months before the uh, before we need to produce the finished goods. <coughs> For example, in July we need to produce two hundred pairs of uh, shoes. So we need to order the raw materials three months before uh, producing the finished goods. So the objective of this system is to lower the firm's inventory uh, investment without unduly affecting production. So um, this system is actually helping the management to avoid problems uh, in order to produce these finished goods. Example, uh, to avoid wastage in terms of inventory and money invested by the management and to avoid a lower level of stock. Uh, at the end of the day, this MRP system will help us to produce uh, the finished goods with minimum problems. Thank you. So for accounts receivable management, account receivable management refers to the practices by a firm 
uh, to manage uh, sales offer on credit. So in this slide, whenever a sale is made on credit, it, it increases the firm's account receivables. Thus, the importance of how a firm manages its account receivables depends on the degree of which the firm sells on credit. Account receivables is a current asset and typically comprise about 20% of a firm's asset. Receivable management begins with the decision of whether or not to go grant credit. For example, uh, a firm need to decide first whether to sell their goods on credit or cash sales. If they go with the credit sales, then the more the sales, the greater the account receivables of the firm. Assalamualaikum, my name is Shafiq. So today I will talk about size of investment in accounts receivable. So there are three factors influence the size of investment in account receivable. This first one is the percentage of credit sales to total sales. So I will give you two examples. So the first one, the business firm with grocery store. And the second one, the firm with a large size of, of business, which is construction lumber or kayu pembinaan. Right. So, the large grocery store, grocery store, they happen to do a cash basis or cash operation, operation sales. This is because maybe their products are identical and the cost of the product that they sold is cheap. So logically they will use the cash operation sales in their daily basis of selling. So in another aspect, the construction lumber. Okay, so the construction lumber for example, to we use this uh, lumber or wood to make bridges or to make um, buildings or projects. So in, it involves a tons or uh, it uh, involves many uh, width lah. So hundred tons, one hundred tons. So the amount is big and high so and when the amount is high so they will use credit sales uh, to smooth the flow of the business all right the second one is the level of sales so the greater the sales and uh, the greater the account reservoirs yes um, I'm using the previous example which is construction number so uh, construction number they if you make uh, more sales you will get more account receivable right so the last one is credit and collection policies so there is uh, a few components that we must look in this credit and collection policies All right. So the credit period. The first component is credit period. So the credit period, the credit period will influence the size of investment in account receivable. So I will illustrate in this example. All right. All right. So okay. So in this example, for example, a firm called Woods Enterprise. All right. So the wood enterprise, they target each day they will make a credit sale of five thousand ringgit. So in this uh, business, when they are selling their products, they give their customers uh, fifteen days of credit terms, and the last payment will be paid on the sixteenth day. All right. So each day they will make five thousand. And at the end of the 15 day, 
they will generate 75,000 of account visible. So the last payment, when the 16 day come, they will make another 5,000 of credit sales, but it is maintained when the customer must pay on the 16 day uh, whenever what the situation is so if you see the AR is maintained at 75,000 and if the size of investment in AR increases so if you see if the firm give like credit term a long longer the period of credit term credit period it will make the account receivable to be outstanding and the investors might not invest in this firm all right all right moving on to credit uh, standards which is sop so the firm must analyze first about the background of their customers before they approve of selling their products to the customers okay so they must check the history of the customers uh, background history lah. so if they have a bad debt to their recent suppliers so they must properly uh, check and analyze well so the account receivable will be maintained and not outstanding all right so the collection policy uh, when the firm deals with slow playing slow paying sorry slow paying account receivable so um, so the firm can either use uh, might be strict or linear approach so if the firm is strict in collection policy he will notify the customers like for example the, if the credit term is 15 days each three days he will notify about the payment that he must pay on the 15 day so the customers uh, will be aware and they will pay to the to the the firm lah all right so the lastly is the discount amount for early payments right so the discount amount also affect the size of investment in account receivable okay all right to attract more investors in investing the firm so the firm must uh, increase their discount uh, cash discount rate and shorten their credit term or credit period for example um, shorten to 30 days and the firm must uh, must make sure or if they want uh, their customers to get a better discount uh, effective rate so the discount will be paid on the final day of the credit term right so that's all for me thank you investment in account receivable is depends on account receivable the more the credit sales the more the account receivable would be it also depends on the collection policies there are two important factors which are the volume of credit sales and the average length of time between sales and collection for example, if the firm wants to increase sales by offering credit sales, they also need a way to keep track of how much money it is owed and how on-time customers are when it comes to payment. Therefore, the firm must be able to look in depth and analyze the impact of these factors in the volume of sales and the cost-benefit trade-off associated with credit decision. There are four terms of sale. The first one is identify the possible discount for early payment, the discount period and the total credit period. 
Secondly, they are generally stated in the form A per B net C indicating that the customer can deduct a discount if the account is paid within B days. Otherwise, the account must be paid within C days. Example, trade credit terms of 2 per 10 net 30 indicate that a 2% discount can be taken if the account is paid within 10 days. Otherwise, it must be paid within 30 days. What if the customer decides to forego the discount and not pay until the final payment date? If such a decision is made, the customer has the use of the money for the time period between the discount date and the final payment date. However, failure to take the discount represents a cost to the customer. The formula of annualized opportunity cost of foregoing the discount is A over 1 minus A multiplied by 360 over C minus B. For example, if the terms are 2 over 10, net 30, the analyzed opportunity cost of passing up this 2% discount in order to withhold payment for an additional 20 days is 36.73%. Hi, today I'm going to share with you about the process of credit selection type of customer. So you guys can refer to the slide number 17 and 18. First, to determine who is to qualify for the trade credit, so we must perform a credit analysis on the individual. Second, default calls vary directly with the quality of the customer. As the, as the customer credit rating declines, the chance that the account will not be paid on time will increase. Here, the customer credit rating refers to the ability of the customer to pay the debt on time. Third, selection costs also increase as the quality of the customer declines. The decline in customer quality result in increase of cost credit investigation, collection, and default. Fourth, in determining whether or not to grant to an individual customer, the firm is primarily interested in customer short-run ability and inclination to pay. Thus, liquidity ratios are the obligation and the overall profitability of the customer become the focal point. One way which both individual and the firm are often evaluated as credit risk is through the use of credit scoring and the 5C system which is capacity, capital, condition, character and collateral. So that's all from me. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. My name is Walid Hassan Zainuddin. I'll be talking about one of the techniques of credit selection which is the 5C system. The 5C is character, capacity, capital, collateral, and condition. The first one, character, refers to the probability that customer will try to honor their obligation. Experienced credit managers frequently insist that the moral factor is the most important issue in a credit evaluation. Uh, example of this moral factor is virtue such as honesty, responsibility and timeliness in paying their debt. This is what creditors are looking for in the ex in this aspect of the customer. Next up, capacity. Capacity is the customer's abilities to pay. The firms will research the customer background in order to know the individual or firm's income. This is done in order to determine whether or not they can pay their debt. The third one is capital. Capital is measured by the general financial condition of a firm as indicated by an analysis of its financial statements. If a firm is applying for a trade credit, the company will look into the financial condition of the firm. The company wants to know the financial health of the firms and how does it compare to other firms in the same sector or industry. The next one is collateral. It is represented by assets that customer may offer as security in order to obtain credit. Basically, this is cagaran. Uh, for example, in our daily life, is a car loan. In a car loan, the car is the collateral. If we are, if we defaulted on our payment, then the bank will take away the car. 
Similarly, uh, a company may require a collateral from the customer in case of a default. The last C is condition. Condition refer both to general economic trends and to special developments in certain geographic regions or sector of the economy might affect customers' ability to meet their obligation. The company will look into the global trends and also the local for us Malaysia and they will also look into the sector in which the customer are doing business in. Uh, for example, right now there is a pandemic going on, the coronavirus, and this pandemic has a negative impact on airline and in the uh, on airline and tourism industry. But it has a negative uh, but it has a positive impact on uh, for example hand sanitizer sale and food delivering service. The company will look into the current economic condition in order to judge whether or not the firms have the ability to meet uh, the obligation. For example, if an airline company right now tries to apply for a trade credit, they might not be able to meet their obligation. Uh, in conclusion, all five of these factors, character, capacity, capital, collateral and condition is used by uh, a company to evaluate credit risk in the 5C system. That's all. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. So I'll be explaining the second technique of credit selection, which is credit scoring. And so this involves the use of statistically derived weights representing key financial and credit characteristics that measures a customer's overall credit strength. Uh, the purpose of credit scoring is to make an informed credit decision quickly and cheaply. So an example of this would be looking through the person's uh, financial history, their background, whether or not they finish paying their credits, whether they pay in small amounts or big amounts to finish up their credits, and do they still have outstanding balances that they have to pay. So this is all into this this is all going to be in consideration before you give a loan to the person. So that's how credit scoring works. Uh, hi and assalamualaikum. So today I'm going to be explaining about credit monitoring and collection policy. So credit monitoring is an ongoing review of a firm's account receivable to determine whether customers are paying according to the stated credit terms. The key to maintain control over the collection of account receivable is the fact that the probability of default in so basically default means failure to to uh, failure to repay a loan in the due time increases with the age of the account. Thus, control of account receivable focuses on the control and elimination of past due receivable. So basically, credit monitoring is um, the firms basically monitoring and controlling their, their credit sales, basically uh, making sure that the account receivables are paying back in the due time and making sure that there are no past due receivables. So there are a couple of techniques in credit monitoring so the first one is average collection period so basically it is av average number of days that credit sales are outstanding an increase in the average collection period may be the result of a predetermined plan to extend credit term or the consequences consequence of poor credit administration so basically average collection period is in the number of day from the day the credit sales is made to the day we receive the money from the account receivable so the more number of days meaning that the longer we have to wait to receive the money from the account receivable. So in this case, the lower the number is the better. So the second one is aging of account receivable. So basically, it is a schedule that indicates the percentage of the total account receivable balance that have been outstanding for a specified period of time. Its purpose is to allow the firm to pinpoint problems. So basically, aging of account receivable is like uh, it's basically like a report where you can see all the list of your account receivable, 
and it helps you to decide what actions needed to be taken against this account receivable. The third is ratio of receivable to asset. So basically the ratio from your account receivable to your asset. The fourth one is account receivable turnover ratio. So basically account receivable turnover ratio measures the efficiency in collecting debt. So the formula is uh, net credit sales over average account receivable. So basically if you get uh, the higher the ratio, the higher the number means the shorter number of days needed to collect the debt. So which is the higher the ratio, the better. The last and the final techniques is ratio of bad debt to credit sales. So just as the name sounds, it's basically you are c calculating the ratio of the bad debt from your credit sales. So the higher the ratio means that you are having more bad debt in your credit sales, which is not good because you unable to collect the debt. So an increasing in this ratio may indicate too many weak accounts or an aggressive market expansion policy. Alright, now moving on to the next slide which is collection techniques. So this is basically steps on how the firm can collect payment from their customer. So the first point here is letters and the second point is telephone call. So let's say for example, the credit period given to a customer is 30 days but after the end of 30 days, the customer still has not paid the debt. So in this case, the firm can take action by sending letters to remind the customer about the overdue payment. And if still there is no response, the firm will make a telephone call to request for immediate payment. And the firm may also extend the credit period if the customer has reasonable excuse for the delay of payment. So that's it. So the next technique is personal visit. Personal visit is something like making an appointment. So in this case, uh, the firm can send a salesperson to meet their customer face to face to confront them, to ask them, to ask the customer to make the payments earlier. So the next method is collection by collection agency. What is collection agency? Collection agency is a business that pursues payments of debts that owed by either the individuals or the company. So actually, the firm can hand over or turn over the uncollectable accounts or the payments that cannot be paid by the customer to this agency for them to collect the payments because they are collection agency. <laughs> Lastly, if the customer still fail to make payments, then the last step is by taking legal action. So this step is the most strict step as it will force the debtor to make payments until it can cause bankruptcy. So they can sue or start a lawsuit against the customer. Yeah, that's all. Assalamualaikum. Uh, today we are going to explain about management of cash. Cash is the currency and coin the firm has on hand in petty cash drawers, in cash registers, or in checking or money market accounts, often called as non-earning asset. The goal of cash manager is to minimize the amount of cash the firm must hold for use in conducting its normal business activities, yet at the same time, the, to have sufficient cash to take discounts for early payments. Uh, for example, uh, Lokman is the manager of the firm, so he must uh, manage the cash exactly to pay the debts, not more or less. Number two, to maintain its credit rating by keeping its current and asset test ratios in line with those or other firms in its industry. Okay, for, exam for example, Lokman's company uh, purchased credit inventory from other company so uh, they, they pay the the debts uh, exactly on certain dates so uh, other company will not blacklist the the uh, Lokman's firm so uh, Lokman can ma maintain uh, their firm's reputation uh, this, the third point is to meet unexpected cash needs such as strikes, fires or competitors, marketing campaigns and to weather seasonal and cycling downturns. 
For example, the company must have enough cash for the unexpected event. For example, if there's fire breaking out from the firms from the firms buildings, then we have to have enough cash to to repair the f- the firm the building later. And the last the last point is to take advantage of favorable business opportunities such as special offers from suppliers or the chance to acquire another firm. Uh, for example, we have to have enough cash so that other companies would look look up to us and they will offer some special offers to us first before they offer it to other companies. So we have four motives for holding cash and the first motive is transaction balance. Transaction balance is the amount of cash necessary for day-to-day operations. They will usually include regular cash outflow such as payment of wages, utilities and etc. The amount of cash needed for transaction requirements will vary from industry to industry. This will in turn be dependent on the certainty of cash flow predictions. For example, it would be easier to predict the future cash flow for pharmaceutical companies than for computer software companies as the rate of change in new products for computer software companies is more rapid. Secondly, the motive for holding cash is for precautionary balance. It is a cash balance held in reserve for unforeseen emergency or unexpected outflows of funds. For example, airline industry hold a larger precautionary balance because of the high degree of cash flow uncertainty. So next is speculative balance. A cash balance that is held to enable the firm to take advantage of any bargain purchases that might arise. For example, construction companies will have a large speculative balance in anticipation of a significant drop in lumber cost. It is beneficial for the firm to have speculative balance to reinvest in their business through various opportunities such as example that given in the slide. Next is compensating balance, a checking account balance that a firm must maintain with a bank to compensate the bank for service rendered or for granting a loan. It is a minimum balance that must be maintained in a bank account and used to offset the cost incurred by a bank to set up a business loan. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to my classmates. I, Dina, will be presenting a topic about risk-return trade-off. So what is risk-return trade-off? So it means the potential return rises with an increase in risk. Based on this principle, we can conclude that low levels of risk equals to low potential return, high levels of risk equals to high potential return. Therefore, our invested money can depict higher profits only if the investor willing to accept a higher possibility of losses. So the whole concept about risk-return trade-off is how a, ma- a financial manager manages the company, manages the investment, whether he wants to use low risk or high risk to generate maybe another income. For the second slide, the financial manager must try an acceptable balance between holding too much cash and too little cash. So, too much cash. The problem is that you are the duit banyak, you simpan, and you tak invest. Therefore, bila you tak invest, duit tu tak berkembang and tak jana any pendapatan for your company. And that is why we have a problem with too much cash. So, for too little cash, Duit you terlalu sikit, you cannot pay any petty uh, petty expenses, uh, liabilities. So, that is another problem in too little cash. So, the financial manager must have a need or a balance to handle too much cash and too little cash. So, for the second point, a large cash investment minimizes the chance of insolvency but penalizes company profitability so when you have a large cash it will decrease your chances of not paying your debt and it will also 
reflect poorly in your company statement. So, meaning we can conclude large cash investment is actually low risk and low return. Because you ada duit banyak kat tangan. You tak invest in anything. You boleh bayar any of your debtors. Tapi you punya profit tak cantik lah. So, we go to this third point. A small cash investment frees excess balance for investment in both marketable securities and longer-lived asset. This enhances company profitability and the value of the firm's common share, but increases the chances of running out of cash. So, you have a small cash investment. Duit kat tangan you, you buat small cash investment. So, you invest in marketable securities and longer-lived assets. It will increase your company's profit. It will increase your company's common share. And it will also runs out. Because you dah in, duit sikit, you dah invest sikit, sikit. Ha, sikit, sikit. Lama-lama, mm, he lesap dah, ya? Yeah? Okay, apa yang kita dapat conclude is that high risk equals to high return. Low risk equals to low return. For the third slide, I prepared a graph to show you how the relationship between risk and return. So, in short, risk and return have an upward linear line relationship. Well, positive linear line relationship. So, low risk equals to low return and high risk equals to high return. Sekian, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum, I'm Rashika. So, I'm going to present cash planning. Uh, cash planning uh, basically is a technique to plan or control the use of the cash. Um, in other words, showing the estimate cash inflows and cash outflows over a planning period. It is necessary to prepare a statement of the firm's plan, inflow and outflow of cash known as cash budget. Uh, the cash budget is an important tool for the flow of cash in any firm over a future period of time. Cash budget is an estimate of the firm short-term cash requirements usually covering a one-year period which is further divided into smaller time intervals. Uh, the period for which the cash penny is prepared depends on the size of the firms and management. Uh, for example, large firms uh, will prepare daily and weekly while medium prepare weekly and monthly for cash. Uh, so, cash budget indicates whether a cash uh, shortage and surplus will be expected of in the time intervals covered by the forecast. Um, so, thank you. Okay. Management of receipts and payments. Slide number 32. You can read. Number one, the receipts. Processing and collecting time for the firm both, both from its customers and to its suppliers is the focus of receipts and disbursement disbursements disburse, <laughs> management. Sorry. Um, maksud dia. Uh, management of receipts and payments. Dia focus to receipt. Um, for example, receipts, the asset, uh, receipt payment, processing, um, for uh, processing, um, macam process the asset, process the uh, payment and collecting time. Uh, for example, the time that the period of time that we we get the asset or we pay the we we pay the payment. This is the focus of receipt and this um, management of receipt and payments. Second, flood funds that have been sent by the payer but are not yet usable funds to the payee. It is important in the CCC because it presents lengthen both the firms ACP and PDP. Uh, maksud dia. Flood, flood tu macam satu amount that send by the payer, payer, payer hantar. Tapi, 
um, bayaran tu bayaran yang pergi hantar tu belum boleh digunakan lagi oleh pergi si penerima so that's the flood second slide uh, we have flood flood has three components you know number one mail flood time delay between when payment is placed in the mail and when it is received which we basically um, uh, bila payment to when payment is placed bila payment di letakkan in the mail and when it is received um, the, 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 the period the period between payment is placed and payment is received uh, that is the mail flood second processing flood time between receipts of payments and its deposit into the firm's account um, maksud dia the period period of time between um, bila kita akan dapat the payment and the payment we deposit into the firm's account so the period of time is we call as a processing flood and lastly clearing flood time between deposit of the payment and when spendable funds become available to the firms uh, maksud dia period of time dari uh, kita deposit the payment kita bagi the payment tu and the payment kita boleh guna kita boleh spend spend able funds become available in the firm maksudnya, maksudnya the payment payment tu kita dapat tu macam kita kita jual aset kita dapat payment so the payment are available in the firm and able to spend spend the funds um, that's all for me thank you Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh um, Now I will explain about Techniques for managing float Okay, the first technique is By speeding, speeding up collection Reduce customer collection float time And thus reduce the firm's Average collection period Which reduce the investment The firm must take in its CCC This can be accomplished by using the lockbox system a lockbox system is procedure in which the customer's mail payments to a post office, eh, to a post office box, uh, to a post office box that is emptied regularly by the firm's bank, who process the payment and deposit them in the firm's account. So here we can see the lockbox system will reduce mail time, clearing time, and processing time. So generally, for to use this technique, we 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 use the lockbox system to manage the to manage the float. So I think for more detail or for more clear, you can see in the textbook. Assalamualaikum and a very good evening. My name is Husband, and I'll be presenting the thirty fifth slide for this presentation, which is about techniques for managing float. So the second technique is slowing down payment by using controlled dispersing, which involves the strategic use of mainly points and bank accounts to lengthen mail flow and clearing flow. Um, okay, so net flow can be increased if um, the disbursement of funds of the bank is um, to the banks is delayed by increasing the mail time. So this can be achieved when we. Uh, for example, let's, let's give a situation of when we have a creditor and we have to pay them and we use the method of paying by check. So when we use um, the check, uh, we try to transfer it to them by using the mail. So we have a check um, transferring to the mail. So when we uh, transfer the check, there is a delay in the transit of the check to the creditor itself uh, since we're using the mail. And there's also the delay on when, we have, when they have to collect the check and, and whatnot. So the delay in the transit of check and the collection of check is able to um, slow down payment. And by slowing down payment, we are able to increase the net flow of the firm. So thirdly, the third technique is um, cash concentration. Process, process used to bring lockbox and other deposits together into one bank. Okay, so cash concentration is basically having multiple banks at different location 
And those locations are basic, are not just like random locations, it's actually locations where our customers are. Uh, since uh, we want them to pay as soon as possible, so we try to uh, establish uh, multiple accounts at multiple banks where they are so they can pay as soon as possible. Um, and after um, they pay, we'll, all those deposits and whatnot from the different banks will be sorted out into one bank which we will collect uh, later on. So the transfer of cash to concentration bank can be achieved through the following mechanism. So the first mechanism is depository transfer check, also known as DTC, which is unsigned check drawn on one of a firm's bank account and deposited into another. Once the DTC is cleared, then the transfer is complete. So DTC um, basically is um, for checks which are unsigned. So after the our customers have made payments on the multiple banks and whatnot, so before they are transferred to that one bank that we will collect late, uh, later, uh, they will be assigned to DTC, which um, there will be a check for um, the checks will be the deposits will be checked on, and once it's cleared, um, it'll go to the main bank that we already uh, approved of. So that's basically it. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Let's continue with the second mechanism of cash classification technique for managing fruit, which is automated clearing house transfer (ACH). It is pre-authorized electronic withdrawal from the payee's account and deposit into the payee's account via a settlement among banks by the by the automated clearing house. Uh, it is it is the same, just like online transfer, but uh, have a bit difference. The example of SEH is uh, when employers depositing money into their employees checking account. Uh, the transaction is already pre-authorized so uh, the employee employer just transfer the amount of salary to his employees. Uh, the next one is wire transfer. Wire transfer is an electronic combination that via bookkeeping entries remove funds from the pay payers bank and deposit them in the payers bank. Uh, in the online transfer, there are some type of wire transfer. Uh, pe people commonly use wire transfer nowadays. Uh, but uh, ACH and Y transfer has a difference, uh, which is like this. Uh, and next, the last one is zero balance account. Uh, it is disbursement account that always have an end of day balance of zero. Uh, it said that, for example, like uh, there are client. Uh, he want to pay to the bank. He will. Uh, he will put the money into the account, and the money in the account will transfer to the bank. Uh, which means uh, the account which he transfer to will have zero balance in the account. Okay, uh, that's all for me. Thank you. The advantage of using cash contribution, the first one, it creates large pool of fund for use in making of short-term investment. This is because uh, the deposit uh, from various account uh, will be put into one account. Uh, this will make a ready to use a fund that will be used in making short-term investment. The next one is it, it improves tracking and internal control of firm cash. Uh, the firm can easily monitor their account by using this concentration, uh, cash concentration account. The last one is it allowed the firm to implement payment strategy that reduced the idle of cash balance. So my name is Maharis. Uh, for my part is marketable securities. Uh, marketable securities is a securities that can be sold on a short notice. Second, it's also called as near cash assets and for uh, the security investment, 
uh, of the firm can quickly convert into a cash balance. Uh, for the last one is highly liquidity short term security either issued by government or by a very strong corporation. Hi, rationale for holding marketable securities, it has two functions. The first one is it's a substitute as a cash balance and the second one it is can be used as a temporary asset. So for the first one, uh, which is to serve as substitute cash balance, it, the securities is held up um, as precautionary purposes to, in order or to guard, to guard against possible shortage bank credit. Okay, for the second function, it is be used as a temporary asset. So, temporary asset in marketable security, uh, it can occur in this one of these two situations. The first one is, if it is needed to finance, it is needed to finance cyclical and seasonal operation. So, as example, if the firm to um, has conservative financing plan, uh, so the long term capital will be exceed the amount of permanent asset. So this security will be held when the amount of inventory and receivable are really low. So the second situation is to meet non financial requirements. So it can the example of financial requirement is tax payment and maturing point issue. Thank you. Factor influencing the choice of marketable security. First, default risk. The risk that a borrower will not pay the interest or principal on a loan. Usually, government security have low default risk. Whereas security issued by cooperation have a risk rating from low to highly speculative. This default risk where borrower can't pay the interest on a loan. Next is interest rate risk. The risk of decline in bond price to which invest are exposed due to the rising interest rate. Financial instruments with longer terms to maturity are more sensitive to changes in interest rate. For example, I give that treasury bills with one year day one year and treasury bill with 90 day. Treasury bills with one year will experience larger price drop where interest rate increase compared to the 90-day treasury bill. Next is inflation risk. The risk that inflation will reduce the purchasing power of a given sum of money. Inflation risk, uh, financial instrument whose return rise with inflation will experience lower inflation risk whereas those financial statements whose return fall with inflation will experience higher inflation risk next is marketability risk the risk that security cannot be sold at close to the quarter market price financial instrument which can be sold immediately at a price close to the market price are more marketable and liquid compared to those cannot be sold immediately. Yield or rate to return, rate of return, return on security uh, depend on four factors that I described above. The higher the risk, the higher the return. However, it must be that safe should not be scarified for higher return. That's all.